Are you ready for God's word? Awesome, awesome. Yeah, we're going we're gonna to preach in a minute. I'm going to preach in a minute. But first, I want to I wanna make a very special announcement. And that is this next Sunday, we have a guest speaker. And I want all of you to make it. Please make every opportunity to come out. You will be blessed if you come out. We're, we're, uh, we're emphasizing it under family legacy. It's not just for fathers, even though it's Father's Day. It's not just for fathers. It's for the entire family. We have Bob Linz, who is an international speaker, coming out. He speaks to over 500,000 people every year. And uh, just an amazing man of God. He's going to bless your life. You want to be here next week. Sometimes I say, oh, we're going to have a guest speaker. I'm not going to be here. And people will, or I'm not going to speak. I'm actually going to be here. But uh, when I say I'm not going to speak, people take off. I'm like, what are you doing? That's the exact opposite of what you should do. So I want you to be here. Amen? Are you ready for God's word? Come on. Amen. Now, we've been talking about speaking life. The title of the uh, sermon series is Speak Life. How many of you know there's power in the words that come out of our mouth? There is. There is tremendous power. I know we've talked a lot about that in the church uh, world. And, uh, you know, it's interesting because anytime the Lord restores a valuable principle to the body of Christ, the enemy comes in and tries to muddy it up. And there, this is a powerful principle that's been restored. The power of our words. And that our words do have creative power to a degree. What do I mean by that? You can create a better situation in a family by speaking words of life. You can create a destructive, destructive pattern in a family by speaking what? Negativity and critiquing and being mean and nasty. You can tear a child down or you can build them up. You can create a bright future or a bleak one. And so it really does matter the words that you speak. They really do matter. And so, have you ever heard someone say, oh, they're just words? Do you ever hear someone talk like that? How many of us have ever said, oh, they're just words? Now, we, we're, we're meaning that, oh, we didn't mean anything by it. Or I didn't hurt you. I didn't hit you. I didn't physically damage you. But do you realize that, that many times Words are more damaging than, a phys than physical contact. You can get over physical contact. Many, you know, I had a, and I don't know if I should say this because I'm going to go with it. Maybe I shouldn't. I'm talking about words, and here I have a, an opportunity. Let's just say I knew of an individual whose parents used to lecture him instead of spanking him. And one time he came to my dad and he said, can I just live with you guys? Because I would much rather get a spanking like, like I see Chris, Aaron, and Isaac get, because we got plenty of them, <laughs> than to be lectured and lectured and lectured. And l because the lecture never stopped in his home. It was like, You'd get in trouble on Monday, and you'd still be hearing about it on Sunday. And with my dad, it was very, very different. He would say, I love you. This is going to hurt me more than it hurts you. Do you realize why you're getting this? And he would list the reasons. These are the reasons. Now turn around and take it like a man. And he would spank us. And I remember my brother never took it well. I'll just be honest. He always jumped, hollered, and screamed, and he would do this number as he was going around and around, and my dad would stop and say, you're going to get another one. if you." Now, that's just extra. Because remember last week we talked about some kids running around here being disrespectful? That solves disrespect right there. Boom. You say, Pastor, is that biblical? Read in your Proverbs. It says, if you spoiled... I mean, if you spare the rod, you spoil the child. But more importantly, it says if you spare the rod, you hate your child. You do not love them because you are, you are destining them to face harsh consequences. 
harsh consequences. So, that's extra. Like I said, more than words is the title of this message. More than words. They're not just, oh, they're just words. No. There's more than just words happening. There's a power and a creative force behind those words. Amen? I can remember Melissa and I used to love a song entitled, More Than Words. That tells you how old we are. Because there's something powerful about the message of words. In fact, the Bible says, a man's stomach shall be satisfied from the fruit of his mouth. Isn't that true? Now, I want you to consider something because, because the proverb, the wise sage here, Solomon is turning that around. Usually, we're satisfied by what comes into our mouth. But in this case, we're being satisfied by what comes out of our mouth. Because what Solomon is saying is this. What you, what you project will create a life for you. A life that will either be satisfying or hard to live in. And so many of us have the life we have created by the words of our mouth. We have the family we've created by the words of our mouth. We have the relationship we've created by the words of our mouth. We have, listen to this, we have the picture of ourselves that we've created or allowed to be created by the words that we have spoken and others and we've received from others. And so I want you to pay very close attention because the Bible says, from the, pro, uh, from the produce of his lips, he shall be filled. Death and life are in the power of the tongue. And those who love it will eat its what? Now you're going to notice something that the Bible highlights the word fruit when it comes to words. And I believe the reason the Bible highlights the word fruit is because it's trying to emphasize, not trying, it is emphasizing, the Bible, the Word of God is emphasizing one of the most powerful principles in Christendom, in all of creation, is the principle of sowing and reaping. That whatever a man sows, that he will also reap. Whatever seed you throw out, that's what's going to come up. If you throw an apple seed out, you're not going to get an orange tree. Isn't that true? You're going to get an apple tree. And so the Bible talks about this in many different ways. Let me share with you a couple of more passages. For out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. Now, we read this the other day, but I want to share with you a little bit more truth about this verse. A good man, out of the good treasure of his heart, brings forth good things. And an evil man, out of the evil treasure of his heart, right, out of the evil treasure brings forth evil things. But I say to you that for every idle word men may speak, they will give account of it in the day of judgment. For by your words you will be justified, and by your words you will be condemned. So he's talking about actions. But do you realize that he uses the concept of fruit and sowing and reaping in describing what he just described? What he just talked about is put in the context of sowing and reaping. Watch. Go, with, go back with me one verse. So we started on 34. I'm going to go to 33. Either make the tree good, right? Either make the tree good and its fruit good, or else make the tree bad and its fruit bad. For a tree is known by its fruit. You say, wait, wait a minute. So I'm either a good tree or a bad tree? Those aren't my words. That's So wait, wait, wait. how do I get to be a good tree? Because I want to be a good tree. Remember, Jesus said, a tree that doesn't produce good fruit will be cursed. He cursed the tree that didn't produce good fruit, that didn't produce fruit at all. He says, every tree that is not producing good fruit, and that does not abide in me, and I in them shall be cut down and torn in, thrown into the fire. So what is Jesus talking about here? He's talking about the seed of life. What is the seed of life? It's the gospel message. The word that came forth. The word that was made flesh and walked a perfect sinless life gave his life for you and I by hanging on the cross. And if you, what? 
confess with your mouth and believe in your heart that Jesus Christ is the Son of the living God and that God raised him from the dead, you shall be saved. That's called the seed of life. And if you receive that seed, you are transformed from death to life and now you are a good tree. So let me ask you, have you ever given your life to Christ? And in fact, if you have, then you should be producing good fruit. By the power of the Holy Spirit, you produce the good fruit. And it also has to do with the words you speak from your lips. It does. You go, whoa, wait a minute. See, from that, from that point, he goes straight into, read it with me. For out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. So if, if the power of the Holy Spirit has filled your heart, then you should be speaking out of that power. Amen? You should be speaking life. What kind of life am I talking about? I'm talking about instead of being so negative all the time, what if we looked at things in a more positive way? I truly believe this is the reason why more people don't want to be Christians. Because they see our lives and they look at their lives and we talk the same. We're just as negative as they are. Sometimes we're even gripier than they are. Sometimes we focus on all the wrong things when God has said, I've given you life and I've given you all things for you to enjoy. Why are you not enjoying them? Amen. And so we have to understand that the words we speak make a difference. We're talking about sowing and reaping. The first point is sowing good seed. Sowing good seed. What do we mean by sowing good seed? Have something encouraging to say. Have something that builds someone up. Instead of criticizing, why don't you bless? Instead of saying, oh, you're never going to. Why don't you say, keep trying. You'll get there. I know you will. Instead of being critical, why don't you say, can I pray with you? You know, yesterday, we had a wedding that we went to. And it was an amazing little wedding. Uh, it, it was very special to us because it was Jason and Jody Siegel's oldest daughter. Now, Jason and Jody Siegel are beloved here at this church. They've been here for 20 years, 20 plus years. In fact, when Serena, who I, I got the privilege of marrying to Cade, um, when she first came in, she was in her daddy's arms. And uh, her younger sister, Mariah, was in a, in a carrier. And he came in, and I, could, I was just reminiscing on all that. But when I got there, when I got to the wedding, I, I went to, to see the groom. I always go to see the groom to encourage him and to see how he's doing and to pray over him. And so as I was going to see the groom, I saw the groom talking to the coordinator, and he looked worried. And so I walk up to give him a a fist bump, and, and he just kind of looks at me like, and, and, and I said, what's going on? Later, when he got done, he says, the caterers aren't here, and they haven't returned any calls. We might have to eat Chick-fil-A. <laughs> now, now listen, what would you have said? Amen. Amen. Yeah. Amen. yeah. <laughs> and that's exactly what I said. Chick-fil-A's great. And so it really does matter what you say in those moments. But you know what else I said? I said, I wouldn't worry too much. It's a little bit further out than even I thought. And it's off the beaten path, the, the wedding venue. I'm sure they're on their way. In fact, I'm going to pray about it. It'll be done. Now they got there a little late, but you should have seen the relief. But can I tell you? He needed that in that moment. Let me ask you, how many times does your family need a word of life? Amen. Wives, when your husband is doubting, you should be an encourager. Husbands, when your wife is sad, you shouldn't be saying things like, I told you so, or you're always this way. How about, honey, I love you. Would you like to talk? When your wife comes in and asks those important that important question, how do I look? <laughs> Never mind. <laughs> Never mind. <laughs> am, am I right? Be careful, because you could get in trouble. 
So I'm sharing with you, sowing good seed is important. In fact, the Bible says in the book of Galatians, do not be deceived. God is not mocked for whatever a man sows, that he will also reap. Do you get what Paul is saying here to the Galatian church? He says, hey, don't be deceived. God is not mocked. That's emphatic speech there. What do you mean by emphatic speech? He's literally saying, hey, don't get twisted up or confused. You will not show God to be wrong. Let me ask you this. Anyone ever counseled God? Anyone ever said, hey, Lord, I got I to, let's talk. You and I, we got to talk. You, you got some things wrong. And I, I want to go ahead and set you straight. Anyone here with that kind of messed up, twisted pride? Because if so, we, we, you know, we, we got to pray for you. But how many of us do that? Listen, how many of us try to counsel God in the way that we live? I know your word says this, Lord, but I'm going to show you you're wrong because I'm going to live contrary to it and watch the way it turns out. That's what Paul is saying. Notice, you will not mock God. You'll only mock yourself by ignoring his word. Whatever a man sows, that he will also reap, it says. If you sow, watch this, for, verse 8, for he who sows to the flesh or to his flesh will of the flesh reap corruption. Isn't that death? Isn't that the same principle that if you speak death, you're going to reap death? So we're talking about sowing good seed. Good seed are words that are faith-filled. faith if you change your words, you will change your life. If you change your words, you will change your family. If you change your words, you will change your marriage. If you change your words, you will change your children. If you change your words, you will change yourself. If you change your words, let me say it again, you will change your life, circumstance, situation. Because your words are powerful and you're sowing seed. Listen to what Isaiah said. Isaiah said this, I create the fruit of the lips, says the Lord. I create the fruit of the lips, says the Lord. Meaning when you speak faith, God says, now I can work with it. Let's get it done. Amen? Some of us are giving God very little to work with. Woe is me. I'll never get anywhere. Oh, now that the economy has turned, we're all in trouble. I'm never going to buy a house. Have you seen my house prices? <laughs> we're never going to get out of debt. We're just, me and my wife, we're just not going to make it. Well, Lord, it's this husband you gave me. <laughs> you know what's so interesting? I've seen people throw a spouse away, and then all of a sudden they throw them away. Somebody else takes them, and they look better than ever. And my wife and I go, wow, looky here. Looky here, what happened? There was life being spoken in that, in that next relationship. Life being spoken. And so I'm here to tell you, I will create the fruit of your lips, says the Lord, peace, peace to him who is far off and to him who is near, says the Lord, and I will heal him. But we're talking about the fruit of our lips. That's why, that's why the New Testament says the same thing. In, in Hebrews, it says, therefore, by him, let us continually offer. So it's in him. He is the seed of life. We have the power of the Holy Spirit. And when we submit to the power of the Holy Spirit, then the Holy Spirit brings forth the wellspring of life, and the words start to come. And it's in him that we, what? Offer the sacrifice of praise because there's something powerful about praising God. Say, Pastor, but I'm just under so much pressure, I can't help it. Then get with God and start praising and learning how to praise. Learn yourself some good praise songs. I'll never, never, ever, ever forget what my daddy did for me. See, I grew up in a Hispanic home you go, wow, I didn't know that, Pastor. <laughs> um, but my, my daddy, he sang what's called coritos. And coritos are little choruses in Spanish. And every time we went somewhere, he would have us sing them the entire road trip. And with a corito, there is no stopping. 
You just keep singing it over and over, and you go right from that one into the next one. And so it's kind of like a, like a medley of little choruses, and you just sing them over and over. What I love about coritos is this, is that they stick in your brain and in your heart. And I used to go, oh my gosh, why do I keep singing this song? Because the Lord was saying, when you're down and out and you're in trouble, I'm going to bring that forth. And it was in those hard times when that would come forth and I would begin to sing. Yo le alabo de corazón, yo le alabo. Some of y'all know it. And I would say, oh man, I'm going to praise you, Lord. I know it's hard to praise you now, but I'm going to ask the power of the Holy Spirit to remind me of what my daddy taught me. Come on, daddies. Some of you need to be teaching your children how to praise. How to praise. Because you're going to need to know how to praise when the going gets tough. When the going gets tough, that's when you're going to need to praise the Lord. I shall praise him. And morning, I mean, yes, morning may last through a night, but joy will come in the morning. Joy will come in the morning. So what I'm trying to share with you is this, is that there's a praise that's offered, offered, and it's good seed. It's good seed that produces good fruit. But this is the thing we need to understand about sowing and reaping. There's also another principle that serves the greater principle of sowing and reaping, and it's the principle of interval or season. What I mean by that is some of us sow seed and we get impatient. Let me, remind, uh, let me share with you what happened with me. My dad got an idea that we were going to plant a garden in the middle of San Antonio. And it's like hard rock soil, I felt like. And so we tilled that soil, tilled it. And then we cultivated it and we pulled out the rocks and all the weeds. And then he said, you're going to pick out your crop. What crop do you want to plant? I was into Bugs Bunny. Hey, don't judge me. Better men than me were into Bugs Bunny. And so Bugs Bunny was all about what? Carrots. So I decided I wanted some carrots. I got some other stuff, but the carrots I was really excited about. Right? There's just something beautiful about a carrot, right? And so guess what? We plant the seeds in the rows, and I'd come and I'd water it with my dad and my brothers, and we started seeing the carrots sprout. It would sprout the little green uh, vegetation. When I saw the green vegetation, what happens? Something leaps in your heart. Oh my goodness. This little bitty seed brought forth life. Isn't that something? When you sow good seed, it will bring forth life. And so I get down and I started digging out the carrots when my dad wasn't looking. And I would pull out the carrot and guess what? There was no, no carrot, at least not like Bugs Bunny's. So I'd put it back. And then the next day, I'd pull out that one and another one, Jason. And before long, I was pulling them all out. Checking them day after day after day after day. Guess what happened? I interrupted the growth cycle. Some of us are interrupting the blessing cycle that God wants to unleash because we speak a good word in one day and expect the harvest to come the next day. And we say something like this. Pastor Chris preached that. Oh, yeah. Come on. Give him praise. Pastor Chris preached that message and I was moved. And so I came home and I decided for a whole week I was going to speak good over you, but you still sorry. <laughs> Isn't that the way we do it? I've spoken good and I've spoken good for two days. Why haven't you changed? And then we get the word involved. God's word says that a nagging wife is like, I'm speaking life. It's the word of God. You just got to receive it, woman. You know, we say all kinds of goofy things, but what we're doing is we're impatient. Come on, God will bring the blessing. Listen to what Paul says to the Corinthian church. He says, I plant Apollos, that's another man of God, waters. It means there's different things going on, but only God can make it grow. Put good seed in the ground. Speak good seed. Let God grow it up. Let me ask you this. The problem that's taken place might have taken place over years. It might take a little bit longer than a few days of good seed. Let me share something else with you. 
if you're planting trees, it takes more than one season to bring forth the fruit from a tree. Notice what God's word said. He used the word trees, not, not carrots. <laughs> you can have some kind of crop after one season, but other crops take multiple seasons for them to develop. Are you hearing what I'm saying? So you're going to have to be patient and trust the Lord if you want to sow good seed. Because ultimately what we're talking about is reaping a good harvest. That's point number two. Reaping a good harvest. Listen to what the word of God says. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight. O Lord, my strength and my redeemer. This is a psalm from King David. Now I want to share something with you about King David. If you read and understand the things that are in God's word about King David, you see him hit biblical principle after biblical principle after biblical principle after biblical principle. How did he know that? It's called the anointing of the Holy Spirit. You have the anointing of the Holy Spirit, and the Holy Spirit will lead you into what? All truth. So when you get into God's word, he will begin to show you those principles like he showed David. Like he showed David. Watch the principle that he is, he's espousing here. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart. What did Jesus just say? We just read it in Matthew. Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. What is David saying? I need you to keep my words and my heart because I know that my words come from my... Ooh, that's by the power of the Holy Spirit. He's speaking life. Now watch this. Be acceptable in your sight. Another biblical principle. I know that every single word I say, what did Jesus say? I will have to give account for it. So listen to David. He says, my words are not my own. Lord, let them be acceptable to you. Amen. Amen. Watch this. Watch this. So David's a young man, and his brothers have gone off to war, and the Philistine army has come against them. The way this works... The way this works is the Philistine army came against them, and instead of fighting, they called out. They said, no, we're going to bring out our champion. You bring out your champion. Only problem is their champion was almost 10 foot tall. That's huge. That's three foot taller than Shaquille O'Neal. And you know what's so interesting? I heard a TED talk the other day. Ridiculous. You got to watch those TED talks. Um, like, no, you got to watch him, like, be careful with him. <laughs> That's what I mean. So he was saying that, oh, it really wasn't that big a deal because the giant had a condition more than likely that was uh, known as gigantism, which means your body gets, gets um, you have this, this condition where it causes your body to grow very large. You're very slow in your motor skills. You have... Uh, diminished eyesight. You have all of these deficiencies. Only one problem. God's word that says that this man, Goliath, was a giant since he was a child. Since he was a youth, a young, a young man. So if you're a giant and you have all these deficiencies, how do you become a champion over an extended period of time? Because what the, the way this goes is we bring forth our best warrior, you bring forth your best warrior, and they don't play patty cake or rock, paper, scissors. No, they fight to the death. And whoever dies is not the champion. <laughs> isn't, that, isn't that how that works? So if you have all of these deficiencies, how do you become a champion over years? You don't. This man is the real deal, honest to goodness, holy field. So what happens here? He shows up. Watch what the Bible says. And every morning and evening for 40 days, he defies the armies of the living God. Do you realize that that's the way Satan works? He's going to bombard you, not for one day, but he's going to be relentless in your face, reminding you of your challenges. And notice what it says. 
every morning and evening, every evening and morning, every morning and evening, and evening and morning. He wants to get you before you go to bed. He wants to get you right as you wake up. He wants to remind you right before you go to bed so you have trouble sleeping. And he wants to get you right as you wake up so you think about it all day long. He's covering you at both ends and he's going to tell you, you're not going to make it. Your marriage isn't going to make it. Your business isn't going to make it. This isn't going to happen. And he stands there gloating over you, gloating over you because he wants to do two things. He wants to have it sink in so that it will break your confidence and break your faith in the almighty God. And once that happens, then you coward back and he just keeps speaking over you and over you and over you. Is someone hearing what I'm saying today? Is someone tired of the giants in your life? Are you here to say no more? No more. I'm not going to hear that word of the enemy telling me about my addiction. I am free in the name of Jesus. The Bible says, he who the Son sets free shall be free indeed. The Bible says, I can have the family that he died to give me. That family is his ideal. His ideal. Therefore, I believe for something greater. I'm not good with this mediocre living anymore. I'm tired of day after day, evening and morning, just the enemy's voice. It's time that I start lifting a holy praise to my king. I refuse to go any further without someone praising the king of glory. Come on and praise him. Believe like you believe. I'm tired of singing songs we don't even believe. We're talking about slaying giants and moving mountains and splitting red seas. Well, how about it in your life? How about it in your life? Don't just sing it, believe it. Call it forth. You say, oh, pastor, you know, I I don't know how I feel about messages that are all motivational. You're just getting a little too motivational. I like when you get deep. See, the problem I have with motivation is it doesn't last, pastor. I would say, neither does a shower, but you take one. (laughs) Can I tell you, we got, you know, sometimes you just got to get some good old fashioned motivation in you. Saying today, we got to get this, this word of God going because, because I have been sowing bad seed and I'm reaping a bad harvest. I want to, I'm talking about sowing good seed so that I may experience reaping good harvest. So this is what, da- what happens with David. And all the men of Israel, when they saw the man, fled from him and were, were dreadfully afraid. Then David spoke. Notice, he used his words. He spoke to the men who stood by. Now you say, what was David doing there? If he's a young man, he's not a part of the army. He's basically an Uber Eats driver. That's what he's doing. He's delivering food to his brothers. His dad calls him in from the field where he was a shepherd, and he says, hey, I need you to go take your brothers some bread and pizza. I mean, some bread and cheese. That's that's pizza, right? For those of you who are Hispanic, that's a quesadilla. I mean, he's taking (laughs) some food, and he sees this going on, and he starts to, to weigh in on the matter. He said, He said to the men who stood by him, what shall be done for the man who kills this Philistine and takes away the reproach from Israel? Now watch the question he asks. Do you realize that questions are powerful? Sometimes they're more powerful than statements because when you ask a question, your brain is required to answer it. So is your heart. So be careful the questions that are asked of you But more importantly, be careful the questions you ask of yourself when you say, why am I so stupid? Why don't I ever succeed? Notice the good question he asked. Watch. He says, who is this uncircumcised Philistine? What is everyone else looking at? They're looking at how many men he's killed. They're looking at his size. They're looking at how can someone that big be so fast? I can remember I was, uh, Daryl Garner played for the Miami Dolphins under Jimmy Johnson and ended up playing on the Super Bowl team with Santana Dotson for the Green Bay Packers. And Daryl Gardner was a Baylor guy. He was 6'8", 
and he was my next door neighbor. And he would come out and he would call me big dog. And I'm like, no, I'm little dog, you're big dog. And I was talking to Daryl one time out there in the parking lot or in the little courtyard of our apartments. And I said, Daryl, just for, just for fun, man, if, if, I, if I decided, you know, you got on my nerves and I just smacked you one. And I took off running. He goes, I'd catch you within 10 feet. <laughs> he said, I've seen you run. <laughs> and he says, at the compound, at the combine, you're going to see my first 10 steps are my fastest. And that's why I'm going to play on Sunday. I said, man, someone that big should not be that fast. And this is the thing. He's 10 foot tall and he's super fast. And that's what they were focusing on. What does David focus on? Watch. Watch. He says, who is this uncircumcised Philistine? Circumcision was the sign of the what? Covenant. Meant he was under God's authority. Or you're not under God's authority. So David is saying, he's operating without God. We're under God's authority. We have the seed of life. Can I tell you, you have the seed of life because Jesus said circumcision is of the heart when you put your faith in God. When you put your faith in God, you are brought into covenant relationship with the almighty God. And this is what David is saying. If you have God for you and you're under God's authority, then he is for you. No one can be against you. This man, this man may be big and he may have all of those qualities in the physical, but he is clearly against God. All I have to do is step up and be willing to represent the almighty God. I just have to be willing to represent the almighty God. So, so this is what happens. He says that he should defy the armies of the living God. Watch David's proclamation. It tells you everything you need to know. This day, the Lord will deliver you into my hand. And I will strike you and take your head from you. David. You remember when he said, let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable to you. You say, Pastor, I'm having trouble speaking like this over my problems, over my giants, over my situation, over my life, over my circumstance. I, I, I just, then you need to spend more time with God. Spend less time looking at the problem and more time with the provision than the problem. Spend time with God. Spend time with God because David is speaking out of an anointing here. Watch what he says in verse 47. Then all this assembly, he's speaking for all his countrymen, this entire assembly, ours, our people and the Philistines are going to know, they shall know that the Lord does not save with the sword and spear. What is David saying? It's all about authority and lining up under God's word because God's word is powerful and God's word had already told Israel you will be the head and not the tail no one will be able to stand before you if you are for me I will fight your battle you don't you just have to stand and watch me so David is in fact proclaiming a valuable principle that we all need to know he's saying I know this that every young Jewish boy is circumcised when when? On the eighth day. On the eighth day, they are circumcised. David is in fact saying, any young boy, eight days old or older, can defeat this guy. Like, no, no, I, I just can't believe that. Read it again. Everyone will know that the Lord does not save by your strength. Some trust in horses and some trust in chariots, but we shall trust in the name of the Lord our God. In the spirit of the Lord our God. And that's what David is saying. He's saying, look, there's something powerful about the promises of God. It's time you start not only speaking them, but believing them. Assuredly, I say to you, here's the principle David is hitting upon. It's a principle that Jesus spoke. Assuredly, I say to you, Jesus said, whoever says to this mountain, 
or to that mountain or the mountain in your life. Be removed and cast into the sea and does not doubt in his heart, but believes that those things he says will be done. He will have whatever he says. He will have whatever he says. Don't you see this beautiful, powerful principle? You want to reap harvest? Start speaking the authority of Almighty God under the authority of Almighty God. You have the seed of life. You have the seed of life. Okay, so watch. I've got one more, one more story and then we're done. There's a story I, I just covered in the Old Testament, David's. Now I want to share one with you in the New Testament. This is quite remarkable. Now when Jesus had entered Capernaum, a centurion. Now a centurion is a Roman officer. You can, see, you can hear the word century there. They were over 100 troops, roughly. 100 troops. This was the strength of the Roman army. This was their strength. If you go back and read history, they had some amazing commanders at this level. And so this commander comes to Jesus saying, Lord, my servant is lying at home, paralyzed, dreadfully tormented. He's really sick. He's in a really bad shape. And Jesus says to him, I will come and heal him. Come on, do you know that, that the Bible says in the book of James, sometimes we have not because we ask not? Notice, all he had to do was ask. He said, Lord, this is happening. Can you come and heal him? And what did Jesus say? Well, I don't know. You're going to have to convince me. Let's make a deal. How many of us, we ask more like, oh, Lord, I got this thing I want to ask you, but if you do this for me, then I'll do this for you. Or, Lord, I want to remind you of all the good things I've already done. So, God, in a sense, if you would please hook me up, hook a brother up. Because I've been doing all these things for you. In a sense, you're saying, you owe me, Lord. Instead of just saying, Lord, here's my need. And I know you're the great provider. Notice the faith in just coming forth with the need. Now, watch. Jesus says, I'll go heal him. Now, watch what the centurion tells him back. The centurion answered and said, Lord, I'm not worthy that you should come under my roof, but only speak a word and my servant will be healed. For I also am a man under authority, having soldiers under me. And I say to this one, go, and he goes. And to another, come, and he comes. And to my servant, do this, and he does it. What is this man saying? He's saying, I know a couple of things about the principles of power. Power always accompanies authority. Unless it's renegade power. And renegade power has no loyalty and doesn't last. Okay? He's saying, he's saying real power always comes with real authority. And I've seen it. I've seen it in the Roman army. And so I'm watching you. you don't, you're, you're not just operating in the physical. You're operating in the spiritual. Therefore, I know that there's something remarkable about who you are. And I know that all you have to do is speak the word like I speak to my commanders and my commanders speak to me and it gets done. Speak the word and it will be done. Come on, how many of you know that's what I'm trying to get across in this message, that if you line up under God's authority and get that deep in your heart, things will begin to move in your world. You will sow good seed and reap even better harvest. Better harvest. If you would start to speak life, even over yourself, instead of, why am I always doing this? Lord, I don't understand why exactly you caused me to triumph, but you always cause me cause me to triumph, always cause me to prosper. Lord, your word says I am more than a conqueror. Your word tells me over and over and over different places that you are for me. You tell me not to lean to the right or to the left, but in all my ways acknowledge you and you will direct my path. So Lord, thank you because I already know you're laying it out. You told me you saved me for good works. I am your masterpiece created in Christ Jesus to do good works. Lord, I cannot wait to see what good works you have for me today. Good works, Lord. I know you have good works for my son. I know you have good works for my daughters. 
I know, Lord, that you, that you bless the work of a man's hands, the work of a woman's hands. So, Lord, I don't have to doubt whether you'll provide for me. You've already provided. You're not about to stop now. You're not about to stop now. You haven't brought me this far just to drop me. Lord, you are for my marriage. Marriage was your idea, not mine. Your idea. Therefore, Lord, it is blessed, and what you have blessed, no man can curse. It's done in Jesus' name. That's what he's talking about. Now watch verse 10. When Jesus heard this, he marveled. Do you realize that the word marveled is the same word that's used when the disciples see Jesus calm the seas? They stand there in awe, marveling, going, so what made Jesus do this? The fact that this man connected the principle and all he had to do was just watch. If you just watch what's happened in your life, you'll know the principle of sowing and reaping. When you speak life, life happens. When you speak death, death happens. And if you can connect with that, you'll marvel too. And others will marvel going, you? How did you, what did you? And then you can say, to God be the glory. Amen. To God be the glory, amen. <laughs> so you say, okay, pastor. You said you had three points. You've only gotten to two. The last one is super quick. We've talked about the seed and we've talked about the harvest, but any farmer will tell you, any gardener will tell you it takes a lot of hard work. So we're talking about putting in good work. Yes. Sowing good seed, reaping good harvest, putting in good work. You've got to put in good work. The Bible says, work out your salvation with fear and trembling. The Bible says this, set a guard, O Lord, over my mouth. Keep watch over the door of my lips. The truth is, you can get inspired over one message and go out for one day, but I'm gonna ask you to do it day after day after day after day. Get alone with the Lord and say, Lord, you know what my tendency is. You know I get snarky. You know I get snippy. You know I get sarcastic. You know when I get this way, I do this to my spouse. I speak down to my children. I speak out of frustration in these situations. In those moments, I need to have you hold me accountable. That's the hard work. Amen? Amen. Watch what he says. He says, whoever keeps his mouth and his tongue keeps himself out of trouble. Isn't that true, husbands? Can I get an amen? <laughs> Let no corrupting talk come out of your mouths, but only such as is good for building up, as fits the occasion, that it may give grace to those who hear. So you're going to have to work at, like me. Lord, give me wisdom to say the right thing at the right time. The Bible calls it a fitly spoken word. It's worth more than gold and silver. See, James finishes it this way. If any man thinks, if anyone thinks, he is religious and does not bridle his tongue but deceives his heart. This person's religion is worthless. Come on, Christians. If we have the seed of life, then it should come out in the way we talk. But notice what James says. You've got to bridle that tongue. That means you've got to allow the Holy Spirit to tame your tongue. To tame your tongue. Some of us have some work to do this week. Some of you looked at me and said, Pastor, it's not this week, it's this month. <laughs> Others might have a year. <laughs> but if you allow the Holy Spirit to speak to you, he'll start bringing forth that life, that life, that life. Ultimately, he wants us to be a witness to him. That's where we're going to finish this entire series on how to witness but it starts with people watching you and watching the way you talk and the way you handle situations, the way you handle your relationships with your loved ones. 
So as we bring this to a close, would you just ask the Holy Spirit, just say, Holy Spirit, begin to move in my heart and show me. Show me those things I need to address. For somebody else, he may point out a giant that's been intimidating you. Maybe a financial giant, a relationship giant, a workplace giant, a confidence giant. Because those giants have you speak negativity too, don't they? And so as you ask the Holy Spirit to reveal his will to you, line up under his word and go in his authority. Go in his authority, amen? Father, every week we partake of this beautiful sacrament, this beautiful ordinance given to the church. This is known as the cup of joy that a bridegroom seals the betrothal with his bride. And he promises not to partake of it together, meaning with our groom, until he returns. And so, Father, as a church, we do this longing for your return and saying to you, come quickly. Maranatha, come quickly. Until you return, Lord, we shall live free. In Jesus' name. Amen. Church, I love you. Don't forget next week, family legacy. We're going to have an awesome time.